My sister had severe cerebral palsy. She visited me in a dream and showed me the most beautiful scenery. And I've heard you talk about your pre-birth experience, Melissa, and it sounded it like match where the colors mm -hmm. cannot be described. The song and the musicality and the multi-level, all of the experience, it's all happening in one moment. Your sister joined your team of guides after yeah. she crossed over. What type of role does she play for you now? I am here today with Heather Mays. And she has had shared death experiences, precognitive experiences. She is involved in so many different healing modalities. She is the creator of the Aware Method of Conscious and Connected Living, the Biolumosphere and Quantum Radiance Resonance Healing Modalities, and the founder of Radiant Light Academy. I am delighted to have you here, Heather. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you, Melissa. It's such an honor to connect with you and your beautiful community. And I look forward to our conversation so very much. Me too. So I guess we could start at the beginning. I would love to hear how your spiritual journey began. Did it begin when you were a child? It did. And I don't even know if I've ever been off of a spiritual journey. So I, and I don't mean that to sound arrogant at all. I think my earliest memories are those of having a team of guides with me. So I categorize that as kind of a, a group of disembodied entities, which sounds a little creepy, but I think <laughs> people watching this conversation <laughs> know what I mean yeah. by that. But I just always had this awareness of other, other energies, kind of the feeling of if somebody you know walks up behind you you just kind of you could tell your husband maybe from one of your kids you, they just have an energetic signature that you feel so i was always able to detect three or four different energies with me kind of riding shotgun i, I like to <laughs> that's how i describe it and they would observe my day with me and when I would go to sleep at night, I would have, like you mentioned in the intro, a little bit of a life review, and we can unpack that a little bit um, later in the conversation. And then very early on, also, I had my first shared death experience with my sister, Wendy, when I was six years old, and she passed away when she was nine. So I really don't have any awareness of not having that kind of glimpse into multi-dimensionality and, and energy and all of that. Now, whether or not that made me feel completely weird and abnormal, that's a whole other conversation or a whole other aspect. But I think for me, that was just kind of, I, I came in, you know, boots on the ground, ready to go with the spirituality aspect in that regard. That's fascinating. And I think that a lot of children probably come in like that, but then end up shutting it down. And so it's always Absolutely. very interesting to talk to somebody who can remember all the way back. So you yeah. have these three or four energy beings. And I know that these things can be impossible to put into words. Sometimes you talked about the energetic signature, which is something that I've also experienced my entire life. But most of the time, it's really hard to translate it into words because the subtleties just don't translate over. But is yeah. that something that you can explain in more detail who those beings were? Yeah, and you're right. Our language falls so very short of what we're able to explain and how we can kind of color something in. So for me, it the best representation or, or explanation I can give for it is I kind of liken it to the image that I'm sure so many of us are familiar with of the proverbial angel and devil on your shoulder, right? It's just this kind of extra being. They were not angelic nor demonic, but they're just kind of witnessers of your life. So for me, I feel that many of us, if not all, come in with an assigned guide or partner. So someone who is almost holding ground in 
a multidimensional aspect to be your kind of plus one in this lifetime. So they have a different perspective of what you're walking through as a human. You contract together as souls to say kind of like, hey, I'm going in. Can you spot me? Like, like at the gym when you're lifting weights, can you keep an eye on me? and not give me the answers at the end of the book and not give me the lottery numbers, but help me stay on task for the mission that I chose in this lifetime because it's gonna be grueling, it's gonna be hard, there's gonna be density, there's gonna be challenges. I won't be able to see them all because I'm on the field, can you help? And that's how I like to explain it sometimes too if you think of maybe like a football game. We in our human incarnations are like the players on the field. We can see things, we can see where to throw the ball, we can see where we are in relation to the end zone or anything like that. There are also coaches on the sidelines who have different perspectives. And then there's the individuals, like the owners of the team in the skybox that have that really expanded view where they can say, hey, you guys probably didn't see it because you were too close to it, but this thing was happening and we wanna make you aware. So from my, perspective in my experience is that that's kind of the role that our guides play is to have that expanded awareness. They're not overriding our free will. They're not forcing us to make decisions. They're just coming in with other information that maybe we didn't have because we're limited in our human experience to what we can witness and see and expand into. So did that answer the the question a little bit, I hope? Absolutely. And there's a couple things mm -hmm. I want to highlight with what you said. The first one is when you mentioned that they they are witnesses of your life, which I think is so beautiful because at the end of the day, I think that's what we all want is to be seen yeah. and yeah. known and have somebody witness what we have yeah. been through. And yeah. we can't see from this side of the veil unless we have that deeper connection that that's exactly what all of us have like our nothing that happens to us goes unnoticed or will ever be lost yes oh i have chills with that melissa that's beautiful yeah absolutely we're yeah. not alone we yeah. feel very alone but that's part of the experience that we've chosen to have but yeah absolutely we always have eyes on and i think whether it is our own souls in our expanded way, if you want to say like our higher self aspect, I think that is well written into the Akashic records, written into the fabric of absolutely all of creation, as well as having these witnesses of self that we have. So yeah, oh, that's lovely. Right, right. Thank you. So I also wanted to ask you, have there ever been any points in your life where they stepped in and gave you more of a wider perspective or like a warning about what was to come i might liken it more to like gently tapping the hand away from the hot stove on occasion right <laughs> so i absolutely have sometimes gotten warnings about dangerous situations or more often something that is coming up for somebody else i may be made aware of for instance i had a friend uh, many years ago who was experiencing some addiction issues and she lived in a state very far away. I hadn't heard from her. Her family hadn't heard from her. My guides in the middle of, I don't even know, I was having another conversation. I was having a normal day, kind of like a, like a news bulletin. We interrupt this mess with whatever, this image of her sitting straight up in a coffin saying, I need help. And so it was just so out of context with what was happening in the day that I knew it. It didn't come from me. It wasn't something I was imagining. It was like a, a bulletin of, hey, get in touch with her now. And it turned out she did need help and her family went out to assist her in that moment. But I've also gotten just little, you know, precognitive nudges and my guides are, I think too, that often we have, for anyone wanting to get in touch with their guides who may not have that kind of relationship established, we often get a team or partner with similar energies. So I'm a very large goofball and I'm sarcastic and quippy and my team can often be kind of prank oriented, which I know might sound nuts to some people, but they like to put funny things in front of me. They like to often make me the butt of the joke. I 
think by getting me into situations that are just like mainly, hey, Heather, slow down. Look at this from a different perspective. And I know you had wanted to talk about the the kind of 9111 thing. I don't know if this is yeah. a good opportunity. Yeah, no, for sure. That. Okay, so a little context before that, I had decided to break up with my guides. Basically, I wanted to live what I thought was a normal life, just being an early 20-something, not necessarily having the precognitive information, not... I don't know, just going it solo. I thought that would be the thing to do to feel like I could fit in, which is what we we all want at some point in our life to just fit in. So I had, and I had had a number of really strong, precognitive, terrifying dreams, like car crashes and plane crashes. And I just thought, you know what? I don't know what to do with, with that information. So can we turn it down? Can we shut it off for a little bit? And like I said, they're not going to override our free will. So they stepped back a bit. And I didn't experience them in the day to day as much as I, I had been. So during that period of time when they were a little more separate than usual, I had a whole lot of human experiences that were on the unpleasant end of the spectrum. And that's not because I didn't have the guidance. It's because I was out of alignment with myself. But after a robbery, uh, multiple car accidents, being sued for one of the car accidents with a jury trial at the ripe old age of 23, and just all these challenges that I know we all have, but mine seemed to be in a very short window of time. I said to my team, hey, you know what? I canceled the breakup. Could you come back in? Because I don't think I'm really who I am without having you in that relationship of being guides and being in in contact. And so around that time, because my apartment had been robbed, I had moved to a new apartment and was still getting settled in and came home from work one day to see that at that time we had like a visual voicemail on the phone. And if you had a message, it would tell you you had one messages, two messages, three, whatever. So the number said zero on the phone. But when I picked up the phone, it it had a repetitive beep, which was another sign that you had a voice message, a voicemail. So I thought, well, that's that's kind of weird that I didn't get a call, but I got a call. And so I dialed into the voicemail number and heard this very ghost-like, guttural, raspy, otherworldly, and not in like a happy, sunshiny way, very terrifying sounding voice that just whispered help me and I thought okay 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 I'm good with the multi-dimensional stuff I'm good with the realms and all of that this is weird even for me and after I adjusted for a second to it I thought okay what if it's actually like someone who's trying to get in touch with his family because he sounded just very panicked and I thought and I still don't know why, because who would, and this is like when you're watching the scary movie and you want to yell at the character, don't do it. Right. I thought, <laughs> well, I'm going to call the number back because I'm going to tell him he didn't reach who he meant to call. So I call the number back. And it is only an outgoing message that quoted Psalm 9111, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. There was no leave your message. Hey, it's Bob. Leave your message after the tone. It was just that. And I thought, okay, that, hmm, that's even stranger. I think that's a, a, a shout out from my guides, but I don't really know. But I called back again and I got the same thing only. And I tried that for a number of days. I kept calling the note because I thought this is just so strange. I don't understand. And called the number back and just always got 9111, the psalm. I would ask friends to call the number. When they called the number, they would just either get, like, it would ring nonstop or they wouldn't get anything. They didn't get the message. I call, I get the message. Somebody else calls, they don't get it. Okay, so guides are coming back online. One of the things that they like to do is is drop little hints that they're around. So I thought, okay, that was that was a pretty big one. Thank you for that. After I got over the shock of the the weird phone thing. Those numbers, 9111, started showing up everywhere. 
in my world. It might be on like a receipt that I would get from the store. I'd go buy something and I'd have, it would ring up to a total of 9111 or I would get $9.11 back or it would come across, I did a lot of computer work. So it would be on a spreadsheet somewhere. I could go to a bookstore and something about Psalm 9111 would be like this prevalent, huge display in the middle of the store. I could go to the library and pick any book, not even in the religious section, anything like that. I could pick any book, open the page. It would either fall open to page 91 or sometimes there would be like the little annotation of a footnote would be 91.11, something like that happened over and over and over. And one of my favorites was when I was driving down a side road somewhere and saw a book overturned, like the spine was up and the book was flat in the middle of the road. And I thought, I bet that that's going to be a message for me too. Because sometimes, I don't know if you if you've experienced this, Melissa, but sometimes when something is supposed to get my attention, it almost has this extra little light or aura around it. There's just something that makes it stand out from the environment. And so the book had this little glow. And so I pulled over safely, walked over, picked up the book, flipped it over, and it was like a, a graph or something that said 9111. So relentless. And I think back to my point about your team matching your personality, sometimes I don't get things unless they're put in front of me that many times. So my team really likes to reinforce their messages sometimes, but it also becomes part of, you know, what I teach and, and how I help people get in touch with, with their guides, because it can be really innocuous seeming things in your environment. Now, the phone call might be a little dramatic, but the angel numbers that you see, the things that keep showing up for you, that's not you being off your rocker. That's you witnessing the beautiful synchronicity and that kind of bleed through between dimensions and energies that is part of all of our lives if we take the time to witness it and observe it. Thank you for sharing that. What an incredible story. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who have similar experiences with angel numbers. And I specifically wanted to hear your perspective on that because I had a similar thing with the same number. No. So, yes. So I had had experiences with 222 and 777 previously. Right. So it wasn't a new thing for me to see repeating numbers. But out of nowhere, I started seeing for me at first it was 911. And I was uh -huh. freaking out because I was thinking, that's not a good number. <laughs> like, right. what is what's happening? Mean? What's going on? Right. But I would oh, see it everywhere, like you said. And then it expanded to be 211, 311, 511, 611, 711, and 911. And then I would see 9111 and 91111. Like, it was crazy. Ooh, I would, I would log into my... I remember the morning I logged in to YouTube and my subscriber count was 91,111. And then it would be like 911 would be the length of the video I was watching or the time on the timer or on the microwave or just wherever I looked. And it was oh a little bit gosh. scary because 911 is associated yeah. with emergency. But I yeah. received the intuitive guidance as I went along that there are some big challenges coming in your life and this is a sign for you that you need to surrender and be open to yes. positive change. And I did yes. have some pretty earth shifting things happen, but because I had had all of that previous preparation, I handled yeah. it so much more smoothly than I would have otherwise. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. So there's a uh... I don't know if you can see under the lamp, there's a, that etching is the Psalm 9111 over there oh, um, wow, on my it. bookcase. Yeah. So it's kind of like our onboard GPS system, right? That's like, hey, there's a turn approaching. You might want to slow down a little bit. And did you ever feel like, because often I'll be like that. And, and my friends who've known me for years now understand too, where I'm just like, okay, I get it already. Like, okay. We can stop now. Yes, so many times. 
<laughs> yeah. So many times I just said, yeah, I get it. I don't want to keep seeing 9111 everywhere, but message delivered. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. I love it. I love it so much. So mm -hmm. for you too, it's, or, you know, I won't make assumptions about what the message was yeah. for you, but it sounds like maybe it was a message for you to maybe ask for help and allow your guides <laughs> back into your life. Yeah, I think it might have been like a, hey, dummy, how'd that work out for you? Right. <laughs> like, yeah, like, and also, I mean, I, I say that, but there was also such tremendous love with it that, you know, we didn't go anywhere. We've been here the whole time. Kind of like the the people who hide behind the couch at your birthday surprise party. Like, we were here the whole time. Everything that you went through, it will be okay. It will be recovered we've got you but also like mm, <laughs> let's right. not try that again okay so yeah absolutely and and I like to call that one too the the buckle up buttercup sign where it's like mm -hmm. when it's that relentless that it's it's just yeah hard to avoid I love right it. impossible mm -hmm. when it's everywhere mm-hmm mm-hmm so fun so when you get guidance from your guides or messages from them, how do those messages come to you? Are they, do you see actual visions or hear voices or is it more of like a download of information? That's a great question. It, it changes and varies. And I think initially in my younger years, I was primarily, it would be audio, so clear audience that I would hear things more often than not now it's a it's a download and I think that comes to just like with any relationship we'll expand on this definition of, of working with guides even more you get accustomed to like how information is going to come through so it, it varies sometimes I will see imagery but more often it's the instant download because it's kind of like the the post-it note where somebody says yeah you know my or you know my you know how I take my coffee like it's just this quick hit of something that then my consciousness now is so accustomed to I can kind of unpack it from there so yeah it, it's a bit different I would say too if it is something of an urgent nature it's gonna be clear audience or, or come through as something I hear which was very confusing when my tone that my guides would use to get my attention is the exact tone of like an Apple phone text message. So I had to kind of say, hey, I need something different than that because I would be out in a store like what's happening? What what guidance is trying to come through? But it was someone else's cell phone. So another tip, you can work with your guides and say that doesn't really work for me. I'd rather have something visual or I'd rather the messages come in a gentler kind of a way like it can be this give and take that you you build just like any relationship I love that and I think you're the first person I've ever heard say that oh so, yeah maybe that's just my team that I don't put up with that. I'm like <laughs> look this is how it's got to be <laughs> well I think that we're just as as a whole as humanity we're evolving more into an expanded spiritual awareness where we can, more and more people can start to tap into their guidance. And so we have a lot to learn, of course, and maybe that's something that a lot of people just haven't thought of yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think, too, one of the things that I've come to learn from my guides and, and my friends call them my peeps. So when I was first kind of speaking about this very, like when I was a kid, I didn't know any better and I would go to school and say, well, what did what did you dream about last night? What did your guides tell you? And, and you know, people would slowly move away from me on the playground. Oh, no. It's like, what are you talking about, weird girl? So when I became emotionally mature enough to kind of speak about it again, maybe in my, my late teens, early 20s, my friends would help me develop this and they'd say hey what do your peeps have to say about it like can we can we check with your guides too so sometimes I call them my, my peeps and my homies and my team but I think that one of the things that continues to evolve for us is what they would say is that often we think 
guides are somehow more evolved or better or like even when I say it, I stand up taller, right? They're because they can be in the angelic realms, they can be multidimensional beings, but what they would say is there it's just a different perspective. It doesn't mean that we need to be irreverent with them, but we also don't need to have this kind of pedestal that we put them on. And so when I talk about working with them, and this is how I'd like to maybe organize the energy and and this works better for me as a human, that's very acceptable because they are just beings from another, depending how you want to define it, time, dimension, realm, what have you, who are, you know, just doing what they signed up to and whatever incarnation they're in as well to support you. And it, it co-creates in its own way back and forth. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So let's say that there's people listening who would like to be able to connect with their guides. That's a common question I hear. Do you have any advice for somebody who has maybe never done that and how they could get started? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is the request, to set the honest request with intention, and I would say heart-centered intention. That kind of like, I forget what game show that was, but when you needed to phone a friend, like, hey, I, I need... I need some help and I would love to know your presence. And one of the the techniques that I like to help people learn to do, and it, it's not to everybody's comfort level, but I would say, I know you've talked about meditation or have had guests talk about meditation too. If you can't get to a quiet space in yourself, you're going to be really challenged to hear guidance from a guide or a team or angelic beings or anything like that. So start there. If you don't already have a practice of five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day of just reaching for the quiet space, we don't always get it, right? We have the thoughts, we have the to-do list, we have all of that. But doing the effort helps train and, and kind of set your energy. That's also a sign to your team and your guides that, okay, she's ready. She's showing up to do the work or he's showing up to do the work. And then I would say, ask your guides for kind of their signature in whatever way is comfortable for you. So you could even ask for, like we were talking about, show me some numbers, show me a 444 or show me if there's a special maybe anniversary or birth date. Let me see that in a very unexpected way so that I know it's from you and I didn't create it. You can also ask them to maybe, and this is what, where I said, maybe not to everyone's comfort level, but can you let me feel your physical presence when you're near? So sometimes people will feel, this is going to sound funny, different guides can have different affectations of energy. So you may feel like a brush against your arm, and that's one of your guides. You may feel a tingling sensation in your ear, and that's your guide. And why I'm laughing is in my head, I'm like, oh, that's Jerry, my... The hair on my arms is standing up. That's Jerry, my guide. <laughs> like, I don't know. I get so casual with it sometimes. It's funny. But you can ask for something out of your ordinary day-to-day -day because we're so plugged into what is our normal day-to-day. -day. It's the thing that's going to come and get your attention in a loving, gentle way. But look for that. And that is the starting point to say, oh, I see you. And then when you get something that you know you didn't create, it's maybe it could also be a song on the radio. Those were huge for me when I was rebuilding my relationship. Songs that come up on the radio where the lyrics seem to fit exactly what you're thinking about at the exact moment, or you hear the same song over and over, and maybe it's in your car. And then the next day you hear it in the store, and, and it's just like, at, it's just odd like the numbers we were talking about, it's odd in the way that it's showing up. Acknowledge that. Affirm that. Let your team and even your higher self and your soul know that, okay, I see it. I'm paying attention. Because if you kind of dismiss those or brush them off, your guides are going to be like, oh, she's, she's, not, <laughs> she's not picking up what we're putting down. So then they're not going to send more. So it's the pure heart-centered intent to connect, paying attention, you know, dialing in, putting in the work, 
And then reaffirming, thank you. Gratitude is a beautiful frequency to start that relationship with as well. So being in gratitude for starting the journey and starting the partnership and acknowledging that you you have contracted together with these beings in this lifetime. Thank you for even if you can even say, even if I haven't known you were here and I haven't paid you one bit of attention my entire life, I'm so grateful that we can start this now. And I look forward to our partnership. Just like like it's so strange, but just like any relationship you would enter into, treating it with that kind of care and gratitude and awareness and attention. Thank you so much for that. That's so helpful. I would love to switch gears and hear about your shared death experience with your sister. Yeah. Okay. So flashing back to baby Heather at age six. So I want to preface this by saying that my sister had severe cerebral palsy. So she was nonverbal, very limited mobility, and required such intense care that during the week she lived in a a care facility away from our home. On weekends, often she would come stay with us. But it was during the week. One night I was doing the bedtime routine, brushing my teeth and my hair and all that, and the phone rang. And I didn't hear what was going on, but I could tell from my parents there was this sense of urgency and something was up. And so they sent me off to a neighbor to spend the night. And I didn't really think anything of it. I don't think they mentioned where they were going or what they were doing. And and looking back now from the lens of being an adult, I'm sure they were in the mode of needing to get where they were going because they had received a call that my sister was passing away. So while I was sleeping at the neighbor, the neighbor's house, my sister visited me in a dream and showed me the most beautiful scenery. And I've heard you talk about your pre-birth experience most then. It sounded like match where, again, our language fails us. The colors Mm -hmm. cannot be described. The vibe cannot be described. The song and the musicality and the multi-level, all of the experience, it's all happening in one moment. She showed me, as I know now as an adult, what, how I would understand as a six-year-old what was happening. So it was this beautiful, colorful mountain range and colorful, again, doesn't even describe it, neon, holographic, all the things, beautiful mountain range. And it was my parents, my sister, and myself, and we were jumping from mountain range to mountain range. And so my dad jumped across, my mom jumped across a mountain, I jumped across, my sister Wendy went to jump across and morphed into this bird slash angel and flew. And she just kept flying and flying and flying off into the distance or the horizon. And I knew somehow in that moment oh, she's transitioned. She's moved on. She's leveled up. She won't be. But the main feeling was the three of us as a family unit are here. Wendy is not coming where we're going. And because I didn't have any context for really what death meant, I didn't have any sadness around it. It just felt like, ah, she's unlimited now because she had been in this compressed body without the ability to speak, without the ability to move very well. She was wheelchair bound and now look at that she what a glow up she's flying like six-year-old me was like yeah do it go and then I'm assuming my parents picked me up while I was still sleeping and brought me back to my bed because that's where I woke up the next morning and I had this awareness when I was woken up again from my guides that although I may have wanted to say hey guess what do you know what I dreamed about that for some reason, I needed to not speak those words because it was important for my parents on their journey to have the experience of telling me what had happened. So it was this weird disconnect with being the kid in the body that I was and having this other level of awareness of, but wait, don't say anything yet. So that was the the general experience of that. And then that somehow disconnect continued because it didn't make sense to me as a kid really where grief came from because for me I just felt like but she's free 
She's at source. She's with God. She's unlimited. I don't understand why everyone else is sad about it or why people would act differently toward me or toward anyone else because of what we had experienced. And looking back now with the work that I do, that was also such an important part of my journey to understand that we are still here to have the human emotions of grief and struggle and loss and walking through that, even though we can have the expanded awareness of death being a beautiful transition that we step into. All right. Thank you for sharing that experience. I'm so sorry for the loss of your sister. And I can imagine as a child that would be confusing if you're feeling the bliss and expansiveness of her experience and not understanding why everyone around you is grieving. Yeah. And and many people know death doesn't bring out the best in a lot of us because we get those those crunchy kind of emotions. It's not just the grief, it's the hurt. There's often anger and and shock and and all those especially as someone who is very empathic and emotionally and energetically sensitive. That all felt so sharp and heavy and such a contrast to what else I had witnessed because then also Wendy joined the team of my guides and I knew her in spirit, clear as day. Could sense her, feel her, connect with her. And she's great. She was having, you know, no problem with the transition because she was unlimited and beautiful and in her authentic soul level self. So it was this weird kind of, I don't know, dis- disconnect is just the best word I can think for it as a kid. Wow. Okay. So that's amazing that your sister joined your team of guides after yeah. she crossed over. And do you, like, what type of role does she play for you now? Well, now she's, <laughs> she would joke that she, she just said, she's like, I'm retired. Um, <laughs> so it, it was for a long period of time. She was more like the the coordinator so i don't know if you may be too young some watching maybe but the show the love boat was on in the 70s and 80s and when you would go on this cruise ship this character had a like a clipboard of everybody's activities so oh melissa you have shuffleboard on the lido deck at 2 p.m and she just kind of knew where everybody was that was wendy's function was to kind of coordinate and organize and I think she was also a heavy prankster on the team as well. But interestingly, when my father passed away a couple years ago, she stepped back because I think their their sole contract was to be together and, and, I don't know, do explore galaxies, do amazing, wonderful things over there. So she isn't so much present on the team as she had been for most of my life. But I think we were contracted to have that. It's those experiences from her perspective, my perspective that we walked through as as kids all the way until recently. Wow, thank you for sharing. I just love this topic. For some reason, it really gets me excited to think about the contracts that we have with people in our life and how those play out over a longer, I mean, not there's no time on the other side, but yeah. yeah. It's really fascinating, all the intricacies of it. Yeah, I actually think it's really comforting because, I mean, it just gives you this sense that you are not alone. Like you're so surrounded by beings that you have this deep, eternal connection with, really. And your story far exceeds beyond this one lifetime. Yes. And where they may be in a guide or guidance kind of role for you in this lifetime in another, you may be fulfilling that role for them. So it, it comes in and out and morphs into different shapes. And there's this, we are all one anyway. So there's this beautiful intimacy of that relationship and the the trust that underpins it and is threaded through all of that. Yeah, it, it's, I love it too. It's one of my favorite topics too. You mentioned that your father also crossed over and you had a shared death experience with him as well. Would you like to share about that one? Yeah, sure, I can. That one was a very protracted, elongated experience that 
I'm still unpacking two years later. So the decision was made to withdraw care for him. And from that moment on, I experienced many of his physical symptoms in in my body as well. I was also coaching him on because I've I've walked the the kind of death and dying path with many people over the years now, coaching him on how to pull energy out of the body and how to leave a physical body, which is a really odd conversation to have. And we were having that physically, but also telepathically and just experiencing all that he was witnessing as a human and as a soul at the same time, because he was flipping back and forth, which is common as we are approaching our transition. We can be in a body, but then we're we're kind of popping in and out of that consciousness and that awareness. So he could be in, in his physical body experiencing something, but then also as a soul kind of seeing what that afterlife was starting to shape up as for him. And I won't share his details of what that looked like because it's personal to him and we all witness it in our own way from our own perspectives. But I was able to see what he was experiencing and then he would telepathically, because he, he couldn't speak, convey messages to me that I would then share with my mom. And it might have been a memory that the two of them had together that I didn't know. So it was this kind of blend of mediumship and transitioning and shared death experience and and all of that over the period of about, I don't know, 18 to 20 hours. The moment that he transitioned and what I've witnessed from so many others, whether they're family members, friends, friends of friends, pets, that initial moment, and I'm going to harken back to your pre-birth memory, Melissa, because I think you you know what the texture of that is. It's this beyond words, joy, jubilation, just this crushing joy is the, the best way that I've come up to, to explain it because it is such a feeling of peace and bliss and welcoming and relief and release and expansion and remembrance. And it happens in an instant. And for me, if I'm connected with someone as they're transitioning, it will literally bring me to my knees. I can't contain it. It's such a big, powerful, amazing feeling. So yeah, I don't know if you have any questions or want to dive into any other details, but that's the that's the gist of that. I love that crushing joy. It is so hard to put that into words, yeah. but mm-hmm. I really love that. Thank you again for sharing your experiences. I know that these are really personal with the passing of your family members. Yeah, thank you. No, I one of my missions or the way I hope I can contribute to anyone else's story is if what I share can help someone feel a little less afraid about their own passing or the passing of someone close to them, or at least give some language and some context around it as we're going through it. Because as a society, at least in the Western, in Western society, we're getting better, but I don't think we we do death very well. Mm-hmm. It's very fractured. It's um, so very disruptive. And, and we don't, although there are amazing organizations like hospice that that do support that, there's not enough. There's not enough of that. There aren't enough people talking about it in an honest way. Um, and so many people live in just this contracted energy of fear about it that the more we can bring normalcy to it and bring that attention of of love and energy and connection to it, I think I think we all benefit. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I could seriously talk to you for hours. I oh. want to ask you about the life reviews that you had in your body, and I want to give you a chance to share about your work because I'm so interested in that myself. But yeah, so the life reviews that you had while in the body, what were those like? So prob- the one word answer would be strange, probably um, to a lot of people, but maybe not because I, the way you're explaining it, you just have like this normal way of, of 
uh, teeing it up for me. So when I was a kid, and I don't do it as much now as an adult, and I really wish I could, but I would at night kind of have a a conference call with my with my guides, with my team, and with my higher self. I guess she was there as well. But I would look at like a mini life review, like what happened that day. Here's what you set out to do. Here's what happened. Did you let the kid cheat off your paper in class? Did you throw away the vegetables you were supposed to eat? Whatever it was. I mean, I was a kid. What am I doing? But it was this kind of honest look at here's how something went. And then the second half of this kind of life review dream state would be looking into the future for the next day, week, couple of weeks, whatever. And I would be shown like a movie screen of what was coming. I could pause what I saw. I could step into the screen and kind of act something out in a different way. And I did that in the life review as well. So if let's say I, you know, didn't come straight home from school or something, I would be able to redo it or experience it in a different way. Maybe I didn't get in trouble. Maybe I got to eat my dessert because I didn't get in trouble or whatever it was. But for the the kind of predictive dreams, I would be able to, to try different things out. Here's what could happen if we X, Y, and Z. And here's how it would look if we did it differently. And the dreams would start out black and white. I would have the same dream every night if it was something important coming up. And the closer it got to the event, the fewer things I could alter or change in the in the movie and the brighter it would get. So I knew that when the dream turned to color and I couldn't really change anything, it's like that timeline was locked um, in place. And that's what I was going to witness. And sure enough, that's what I would witness as they came to pass. So that's the kind of thing that you're like, now as an adult, dude, how helpful would that be to be able to do that every day? But it's just one of those things that's kind of an artifact of my childhood for whatever reason. That's something I I was so blessed and lucky to experience. Okay, I have so many questions. <laughs> so when you would get the life review of that day that had already happened and you would go back, like step into the timeline and change things, do you think that you were actually changing the past? Is that possible? Oh, that's such a juicy question. Right. <laughs> ah, I don't know. I'm going to say, well, let's answer it two ways. I'm going to say in some timeline somewhere, yes. Right? Because infinite, infinite number of possibilities and timelines. In the one I was on, I think it was more of like just an awareness of here's where, what you could do better if you see these circumstances again. But now you've got me thinking, how cool. If Like if you could have said, oh, well, let's do that instead. Let's pay a compliment to the school bus driver or, or whatever it could have been. And then you get to see that almost ripple effect. Well, then that made her smile. And then she paid more attention to where she was driving or she went home and, you know, made her kid's favorite dinner or, or like infinite possibilities to what that could impact. And maybe all of that was there. I just wasn't able to unpack it at that level as a kid. So, yeah. Well, now you got me thinking, Melissa. (laughs) Yeah, it's such an interesting topic because if you think about it, everything's happening simultaneously. And I, of course, cannot think of her name right now, but I know of a woman who she started something called the mind change method, and she will help her clients to actually change like rewrite the memories of what happened in their past to heal their yeah. trauma yeah and so i've always mm-hmm. wondered like are they just rewriting their beliefs about what That's happened right. or are they actually changing something well here's the thing too let's throw this monkey wrench in there let's say that it was changing something would we know because now we're on that timeline right so our memories so we kind of sever yeah, yeah, we severed the pa- path. Oh, ooh, rabbit hole. Hello. It gets a little <laughs> mind boggling. I love it though. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, maybe, maybe I was. I don't know. So cool. And then for the future events, you were also able to change things. So did you experience them the way that you had changed them when that happened? 
I don't have any real linear memory of that. I know that one of the reasons I have the the memory of being able to do that in my dreams was because a family member who we were not close with, who was not supposed to come to my school, showed up and was going to take me from school without permission. And so that's one of the dreams that I had was this kind of, hey, look out on this particular day. You're going to see this car that's unfamiliar to you and it's going to pull up to the office at school. And then it was kind of the, these like multiple options. If there's a teacher around, go stand by a teacher. If there's this, go here. It was this whole kind of plan that I had down because we had rehearsed it in the dream. And then on that particular, I remember it was like a field day where everybody was outside doing, I don't know, three-legged races and all kinds of sports stuff in in, um, the parking lot at school. I remember the car showed up, she went inside and and I stood by a teacher because I had kind of that like, okay. I've rehearsed this. I know what I'm supposed to do. So I don't know if something else, you know, if we hadn't rehearsed it that way or altered the the timelines that way, if something else would have happened. But I just, I remember the the black and white versus the color part because I would get frustrated. Like, but why? Why can't I go change that other thing that now that it's color? That doesn't make sense. I've never been one that was good with limitation. So <laughs> when, when the options would start getting fewer and fewer, it, it would kind of be like, ah, oh, that's such a bummer. Why? Why can't we play with all of it? That's just fascinating. Well, it's Heather, exhausting. I don't right? know how I was sleeping, right? Thank you again for sharing. This has been such an interesting conversation. And I really appreciate you being willing to share from your personal journey and I would love to hear about what you do. And I really feel like this section is the section of the interview is so important because for most of the conversation that I have with people, we're talking about spiritual experiences and hearing all of this knowledge and information that is so helpful to people in expanding their awareness. But then how do we take that and integrate it? And spiritual work, like what you're doing, is so important and I think needs to have so much more attention. People need to know that these options are out there. So could you share with us the different things that you do? Oh, thank you so much. That is, that's so beautiful. And I agree a thousand percent integration is so key because we get this thirst and this hunger for all these amazing things. And then it's like, but now what do I do? Like, what what do I do with it all? Where do I go? What are the dance steps? How am I supposed to do it? So over the course of many, many, many years, I've developed a lot of different offerings and services that I work with people. So one of the primary ones right now is that's probably like an easy introduction for someone if they are on this path and they want to start to see absolutely how unlimited they are as a soul. Some of the art that I do, I do basically a soul portrait. I call it an energetic signature portrait that is someone's sacred geometry. It's like their shape, their color, different frequencies are kind of included in the art. And it's this piece of remembrance and resonance that somebody can look at and say, I'm so much more than than just this, than just this physical body. So that's a nice kind of entryway. I also do intuitive counseling where my team of guides and me, we show up to the party and talk about like, where are you on your journey? What have you encountered? What are you looking to integrate? How would you like to embody it? And helping somebody go from A to B or A to Z or whatever it is on their journey, maybe um, unpacking limiting beliefs, some of the, the boxes we've been put in, some of the labels we've been given, looking at some of that. So I have a number of different services with that. I also have self-serve classes on a lot of different topics where somebody can just go on demand, watch some videos, work through some activities in that way. And I have live classes throughout the year as well, where we go live online and work together through some different topics. 
and animal communication. We didn't even talk about that. I'm going to have to come back, Melissa. That's all. Yeah. Um, I was just going to mention that. <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. So I also do animal communication and working with pets and the relationship that we have with pets and going back to that beautiful soul contract. We're contracted with all of our animals as well. So looking at that from that perspective. Yes, that's a whole other topic that is so near to my heart right now because I recently lost my cat. Or I shouldn't yeah. say lost because that's a whole other story. But yeah. yes, we will have to talk about it sometime. Yeah, would love to. And changed the relationship, changed the way in which yes. you connect and relate. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, Heather, thank you so much once again. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. It's been such an honor and I'm so humbled and grateful for the opportunity to connect. So thank you for all that you do and put into the world. It's beautiful. Thank you for watching and listening. Your views, likes, comments, and shares truly make the biggest difference in supporting this channel. Don't forget to check the show notes for all the links to today's guests, as well as my links. You'll find me on social media at Love Covered Life, my website, lovecoveredlife.com, and the Be A Guest link for anybody who would like to be a guest on the channel. I have great news. Love Cover Life podcast is coming available on audio podcasts. You can find it wherever you listen to your audio podcasts.